You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. I am elated because we get to continue our conversation in the Set Apart to Serve series. And today we head to Texas. Of course. We uh, always head to Texas. <laughs> we do. We like to, <clears throat> excuse me, we'd like to head to Texas because there are lots of great stories with our, our friends in Texas. Mm-hmm. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting the Coffee Hour. You can find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. Joining us today, the Reverend Dr. Scott Murray. He's Senior Pastor of Memorial Lutheran Church in Houston, Texas. He also serves as third vice president of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Pastor Murray, welcome to the Coffee Hour. It's a pleasure to be with you, Andy. I am interested to hear this story. We, in, in the Set Apart to Serve series, we, we always get to dig into our guests' history of how the Lord brought them into service in the church. And I'm intrigued. I don't think I've ever heard your story before. Where did your formation as a pastor yeah. begin? Well, <clears throat> there's probably many parts to this, but let me tell it this way. I can't remember ever wanting to be anything but a pastor. I can think back to when I was perhaps about five, thinking, you know, looking over the pew, I want to be the guy in the pulpit. (laughs) And I didn't know why. I didn't know why until I was 30. And what happened was my parents came to visit our home. I had been at work all day at church. I got home and my mother said very solemnly that afternoon, we need to sit down around the kitchen table. You need to know something that no one knows. And I thought, oh, what could this be about? I mean, all kinds of crazy ideas ran through my head. And so he sat down, my wife, myself, my dad, and my mom. And my mom said, now you remember how I had a child before you who died at 10 days after birth of a congenital heart problem that they couldn't diagnose or resolve and died without baptism Mm. and how uh, devastated I was about this. And I said, I was aware of that. And she said, when I became pregnant with you, I was afraid that God would also take this child from me. And so she said she spent spent her first trimester in total terror uh, about what would happen to this child, me? And she said at the end of her first trimester, she simply got down on her knees and prayed, Oh Lord, if you'll give him to us for 18 years, you can have him for the rest of the time. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, this was just heart stopping because I'd, I'd never heard this. She didn't tell anyone. She didn't tell my father. She didn't tell her mother. She didn't tell her pastor. She didn't tell a single soul until that day about 35 years ago. And she had prefaced this speech by saying, you need to hear this before somebody dies. Six months later, my dad was killed in a car wreck. And of course, you know, she looked at me and said, I might have obligated you to something you wouldn't have chosen yourself. And I said, you know, it's worse than that, mom. You've, you've, you've forced me to be the high priest because all I could think of was Hannah, you mm-hmm. know, and Samuel. So, I mean, even as a teenager, I couldn't imagine being anything but a pastor. I thought what my options would be if I didn't succeed, you know, in other words, if I wasn't smart enough or couldn't, couldn't learn Greek or whatever it was. And so I'm, I'm doing what God has fitted me to do. I'm, I've done it for over 40 years now, and it's been a great joy of service. I love hearing everyone's stories of how the Holy Spirit worked through different people to encourage young men to consider pastoral vocations or young women to be teachers, deaconesses, other church workers. Uh, and, and your story is, is ranks up among all of them, too, as, as just another example of of how the Holy Spirit works through people. And you have been a gift to the church as well with all of your work. What did the rest of your formation look like? What, how did you determine what schools to go to, what seminary to go to, all of those details? Yeah. So, I mean, my goal, once I decided, was simply to go where, the, where I thought the education was best for the vocation of being a pastor. Um, I chose Concordia University was Concordia College in those days in Ann Arbor, uh, because in those days it had inherited the senior college program, and I wanted Greek 
Hebrew, Latin, German, philosophy, rhetoric, I mean, all those things that, that, that help to form a student toward being the best he can be as a seminary student. After that, I wanted to go to Concordia Theological Seminary because in those days, uh, in my opinion, again, they had all the heavy hitters. There was Robert Preuss, of course, with whom I took a lot of courses. I even dreamed up in independent studies so that he would teach as much as I wanted him to. I, I probably had more hours with Robert Preuss than anybody living, quite frankly, because we did everything we could. And of course, I took every one of his offered courses. And of course, David Scare, who of course is still holding forth at Concordia Theological Seminary, Kurt Marquardt, and many others. So that was attractive to me, and that's why I went there. What was it about that you, you shared, you know, spending many hours with Professor Preuss? Tell us about what it was about his teaching that was that, that drew you in. Well, two things. Number one, he never stopped. It didn't matter. He was never off duty. It didn't matter. He would just simply sit you down and say, let's talk theology, even if it was over a martini. <laughs> so, so this was always a delight. And then secondly, he was, he, was per, he, he was still a student. I mean, he was one of the members of the class, and this was extremely attractive. I mean, so he certainly had absolute authority in the classroom because of what he knew and how delightfully he could deliver it. But, but in some ways, he was still a kid at heart and was always delighted at learning new things and debating over theology, and he would let you get your oar in the water. You know, he wasn't just sort of holding forth. And so there was a great deal of wonderful learning going on there. Who else was encouraging to you as you were on this journey towards being a pastor? Who were some of the influential people in your life who were, who were uh, feeding into you and encouraging you? Yeah. So my home pastor... Gerald Scholes, who is in his mid-90s now, he was an exceptionally good preacher. He delivered the whole content of the Lutheran confessional faith in a well-disciplined way. He wasn't afraid of, of using what we think of as difficult theological terms, but, but he was always really good at unpacking it and, and making it applicable to daily life. He would have been a 1955 graduate of Concordia Theological Seminary when it was in Springfield. Of course, pious parents, they, they were not highly educated people. They were, we were a working class family, but they lived their faith. My dad was very pious uh, and uh, my mother you know, taught me the catechism. The rule in our household, we were Canadians. The rule in our household was no hockey night in Canada until you could recite your catechism, oh. which which was a high motivation, I might say. <laughs> <There would> be- <laughs> so, so, you know, just a one, and my grandparents were very pious Lutherans on both sides. And so, I mean, I had an idyllic childhood. We were poor and I didn't know it. This was kind of funny. Only later in life did I realize we were poor because I was so well taken care of by, again, these wonderful, pious, faithful Lutheran parents. How did the Lord bring you to Memorial Lutheran Church in Houston, Texas, to go from Canada to another country called Texas? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Well, there's a stop in Uh between. First of all, I went to New Orleans, which is totally a different country, um, and served there for about a dozen years. Um, when I had the call to New Orleans, my dad kind of complained, well, you know, you're moving to a totally different country. And I said, well, look at it this way, dad. I could be taking a call to Vancouver, British Columbia, where I'd be exactly twice as far away than I am in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. And he went, oh, well, that's a better way to look at it. So that's, I, that's how I ended up in the deep south. There's more to the story than that, but I'll leave it at that. And then What, 28 years ago, I had the call to be the pastor here in Houston, Texas. And again, one of my theological mentors, or at least a couple of them, uh, had some influence on me. Kurt Marquardt said, well, what are the chances that your present parish 
is going to get an Orthodox man if you take this call? And I said, well, I would say probably, humanly speaking, as best as we could say, 100%. He said, well, then that's easy. Take the call. I also recall hearing from First Vice President Robert Kuhn, who happened to be in New Orleans and decided to call me up. He knew I had a call. And I picked up the phone. It was a Saturday afternoon. Nobody else was in the house. And this voice comes on the line that says, Murray, this is the Holy Spirit. Take that call. (laughs) And I was about to, you know, give him a piece of my mind and hang up on him. And then I went, oh, no, it's Bob Kuhn. I better not hang up on him. (laughs) And so this this was the external motivation for me to take this call. I love being here. I love Houston. I love the people I serve. They're highly educated. You, you can't get anything past them because they're a pretty smart crowd, but they're a joy to work with and very faithful. They want to be Lutherans. They want the gospel preached to them. They want to support that. And, you know, it's been a, just a joyous 20, 28 years, almost 28 years, I guess. And I hear they also want to raise up church workers for the future as well. We'll learn more about that in just a moment. Our guest today, the Reverend Dr. Scott Murray, Senior Pastor of Memorial Lutheran Church in Houston, Texas, is a part of our Set Apart to Serve series. We'll continue the conversation in just a moment right here on The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. We are continuing our conversation in the Set Apart to Serve series. Our guest today, the Reverend Dr. Scott Murray. He's senior pastor of Memorial Lutheran Church in Houston, Texas. Also serves as third vice president of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Pastor, we've heard your story of how the Lord brought you into his service as a pastor serving now at Memorial Lutheran Church and as a as third vice president of the LCMS as well. Uh, now serving this congregation, a, a pretty large congregation in a large metropolitan area, right, in, in Houston. Mm-hmm. How, has, how has the Lord shaped this congregation's heart toward raising up future church workers? Well, my predecessor, Pastor Gene Esch, had vicars, probably had about five vicars over the years. There's another kind of funny story to that. I was supposed, he asked for me to be his vicar by name. And I was not assigned to Memorial. And uh, another dear colleague ended up being the vicar here. He found his wife here. I found my wife on my vicarage. So it worked out perfectly. Uh, But when I got here, it took a few years, maybe four or five years, and I said, well, it's time for us to get involved in the vicarage program. They said, well, that's a great idea, Pastor. We'll, we'll get a guy who can help you. And I went, no, 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 wait, you don't understand. I said, it will cost me. It will not save me. It will cost me. And they said, well, give us a number. I said, Okay. It'll cost me about 10% of my time to be a decent vicarage supervisor. And they said, well, why do you want to do it? And I said, because we want to influence those young men and send them back to the seminary with the right experience and the right set of questions from a, a positive Lutheran parish experience. We've got a school, I mean, all that stuff. Very exciting place to serve. So... So we have done it now with one short hiatus because of a building program since the year 2000. So I haven't had 23 vicars, probably about 20 over the years. So I'm not, I'm not the vicarage champion of the Missouri Synod. That's okay. <laughs> That's all right. Still important work. How do, how do vicars serve at Memorial? And talk, 
talk some more yeah. about why having seminarians who are on their vicarage have this experience in the church is so important in their formation as pastors? Sure. Great, great question, Sarah. First of all, I work vicars really hard. The rumor at the seminary is that this is the hardest Fort Wayne vicarage. And I don't doubt that. Part of it is just because I'm a vice president of Synod, I'm gone a lot. So I just stick the vicars with, you know, substituting, literally being my vicar. That is my substitute on occasions, which brings me to a particular story. So early on in the vicarage program, we had a very nice young Midwestern vicar, a little wet behind the ears, and I had to be gone. It was about halfway through his vicarage. And I said, now, look, you need to go to this meeting. Please don't say anything unless they ask you a question. Other than that, just keep your mouth shut. So he did. And I happened to be in the office the next morning. And about 9.30, I get a call from the high-powered chairman of this board, and I think, oh, no, what did the vicar do? And he gets on the phone and says, Pastor, I understand now why we have a vicarage program. And I said, oh, tell me why. He said, because the vicar we asked a, a question of, and he gave a very good and mature answer. That's not where he was six months ago. That is where he is now. So my goal in the vicarage program is always to take a student from point A to point B. And that's why you cannot look at vicars and say, well, he's not as good as the one three years ago or whatever. That's not the point. You get them where they are and then you push them to get to where they need to be. I, I tend to give them softball things, of course, like teaching these wonderful weekday Bible classes. The preparation for them is hard because the ramp up is difficult, where it's much easier for someone who's got a lot of experience like I have. But it's also a softball because these wonderful, loving people want the vicars to be the best they can be. And they will come to me and say, you know, you need to encourage the vicar to head off people that want to chase rabbits. We want to stay on subject. So I'm able to do that. And, and the kids, the vicars, you know, learn that way. So it, it's been a great experience. It sounds like the vicarage program has certainly been a valuable experience for you, for your congregation, for the vicars serving there and learning there as well. What about younger students, maybe students in the school and, and the younger students who are members of the congregation? How has your congregation encouraged them to consider church work? Sure. Several ways. Number one, we always make a contribution, a significant contribution to the, to the cost of educating the seminary students. Uh, so, so we're helping make that tuition covered so that the student isn't paying any tuition to get through seminary so they don't end up with a big debt. We also are involved with adopt a student. So we adopt, obviously, it, you know, it's beneficial to adopt your former vicar, but, but we will also have a student from the congregation start as a SEM1 this summer at Fort Wayne. So we'll also be involved in the Adopt-A-Student program for him. So that's been very important. And of course, I think the vicarage program is a sacrificial way of helping to form and encourage students to go forward. We've also uh, made sure that Students who want to go to the various events at the seminary when they're, when they're doing, you know, when they're asking the question, is my vocation to be a pastor, send them to the seminary so that they experience firsthand what seminary life is like. So we do lots of, now, of course, I'm always campaigning with the kids to get them to consider full-time church work, especially I work on our acolytes. If I'm preaching, the, the preacher always sits with the acolyte. I always lean over at some point during the service and say, have you thought about being a pastor? Uh, one particular case turned out to be quite humorous. I'd started with the boy when he was about a ninth grader. We, we start acolyting after confirmation. And I leaned over and said, have you thought about being a pastor? He looks at me and goes, no. Okay. So about three months later, I'm preaching. He's acolyting. I lean over and said, you should think about being a pastor. 
Oh, okay. He just dismisses me, right? And then, you know, maybe six months later, I'm there and, and you know, I say, you, you, you do this really rather well. You have some panache in the, in the chance where you should think about being a pastor. Are you praying about it? No, I'm not. Well, you know, a few months later, it was, yes, I am praying about it. And then finally, he says to me, well, what does it take to be a pastor? In other words, what's the education necessary? And then I knew I had a fish on the line. And so I've been working on him. He's now a sophomore in college. He's going to a local community college, getting his degree in IT. And he went to an event in the fall at Fort Wayne to experience the Fort Wayne Seminary. So I'm hoping somewhere along the line that will bear fruition. And that's just just one example. I had a mother, this is kind of funny too. She came to me and said, now, pastor, you've been saying to my son that he should consider the ministry. I thought, oh, here it comes. And she said, you don't say this to all the boys, do you? And I said, well, no, there's certainly some I would think that probably shouldn't have a church vocation, but your son certainly should. She said, oh, good. And I thought, boy, I'm glad she was happy about that. So she she just wanted to know that it wasn't sort of a blanket effort to to rope every boy into seminary education. What are some of the things that you look for in young people, in the, the acolytes, some traits, some emotional capability and or behaviors of young people that kind of light that for you, that, that these are the kids that, that you should be encouraging for church work? Sure. A number of things, you know, that they do actually show up for their duty, prepared on time, you know, and ask the right questions about what they're doing and their involvement in what's happening. Of course, if I've taught them catechism, then I have some idea, both generally their consecration, that I didn't have to chase them every time about memory work and testing and so on. And also, I have some idea of what their capacity is, that they've, they've got a pretty good grip on you know, knowing their Bible, or, or at least they want to know it. It's not, it's not merely that they have content. And also that they worked at, not necessarily were the best at, but worked at their their memory work. I knew that there were some kids who could memorize the catechism, you know, in nothing flat, but that didn't prove consecration. So so it isn't necessarily always the very best students that that might be encouraged. This young man that's the 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 sophomore in college. When I talked to him on the phone about going to the seminary and checking things out, he volunteered to me that suddenly over the last couple of years while he's in college, his Christian faith has meant a whole lot more to him than it ever had before, that he sort of just sort of swam through life or whatever, but now his faith is very significant to him. And that's exactly what you want to hear from someone that's a potential church worker. For other congregations that <clears throat> might consider things like the Vicarage program or or encouraging students to be acolytes and um, what they might learn through that through that experience. What would be your encouragement to other congregations to consider in encouraging students to consider church work vocations in the future? Sure. Well, intentionality. Uh, you you can't just presume that the kid's going to get the brainwave to go into the ministry. You you have to encourage the boys to pastor it, and of course, the girls also to the auxiliary offices. You have to point out to them, first of all, the gifts that God's given them and the way that God will equip them with his gifts, with his treasures, with his gospel, with his blessings. And now, of course, we were very intentional about our acolyte program that the goal was not to light candles. Anybody can do that. You can do it with a bit click. The question is, what is the strategic goal of an acolyte program, which is a pain to administer? It is to get a boy sitting beside his pastor so his pastor can lean over and say, you should pray about going into the ministry. And our acolyte program has been very helpful in that way. 
Our guest today, the Reverend Dr. Scott Murray, Senior Pastor of Memorial Lutheran Church in Houston, Texas, and Third Vice President of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Pastor Murray, thank you so much for being our guest on the Coffee Hour. It was a pleasure. Good to see both you and Sarah. You can learn more about Set Apart to Serve by visiting lcms.org slash SAS. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store.